Welcome to everyone across the globe uh, to the next session in these uh, terrific ortho evidence uh, virtual tours. So this is Insight World Tour. Uh, today our guest speaker is coming to us from the United Kingdom. Um, and uh, these, he is, uh, you can go to the next slide there, Abby. Thanks. Just a couple of housekeeping before I introduce our speaker. Uh, just a reminder that the event is recorded. Um, so during the presentation period with the speaker, uh, everyone will be muted and their video is off just to help with the uh, the bandwidth. During the discussion period, uh, we're going to turn the videos back on and unmute to ask questions. So if you have any questions, uh, you can unmute and ask. Uh, you can use the raise hand app on the, in the Zoom, uh, or you can certainly uh, place a question in the chat box to everyone and we'll continue to moderate that. And we're going to obviously upload the, uh, uh, the talks to the uh, World Tour site afterwards. So just in case you missed some pertinent things or want to go back and take a look by all means. Um, just a reminder that you have to register and uh, for each event separately. And these are some of the upcoming events. Uh, there have been a few that have already occurred. And as, as I mentioned, the recordings are available. Uh, but today we have a, a terrific event coming up. Next slide. So just quickly, I prefer to introduce myself. My name is uh, Vic Khan. I'm an orthoplastic surgeon here at McMaster. And I'm going to be co-moderating the session with uh, Mo Bandari here today. And uh, I want to introduce our fantastic speaker today. His name is uh, Vikas Kanduja. Uh, you may have heard of him. He is a consultant surgeon in uh, Cambridge. He, is the, he initiated the Cambridge Young Adult Hip Service there. He's uh, primarily an orthoplasty and a sports medicine specialist with an obvious interest in uh, hip arthroscopy, which is what uh, today's topic is going to be about, as he speaks to us about the past, present, future of arthroscopic surgery of the hip. Uh, he's a fantastic researcher with a great pedigree. He sits as an associate editor on the JBGS board, uh, and he has a number of publications to his name. Uh, so you're certainly getting a world-class speaker today. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Vikas, and I'm um, looking forward to hearing his talk. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vic, and uh, Mo, for inviting me to uh, the Auto Evidence uh, World Tour. I'd like to introduce uh, my uh, panelists today. We've got uh, Dr. Oliver Marine Pena from Spain. We've got uh, Dr. Anand Sadesai, an uh, anesthetist in uh, Addenbrooke's Hospital. We've got Mr. Uh, Sunil Kumar, who is a fellow in young adult hip surgery. We've got uh, Mr. Nicola or Dr. Nicola Bonar from uh, France and uh, Dr. Thanos Patrisou from uh, Greece, who would be our panelists today. Uh, as far as the discussions are concerned. So Abby, if you, it's okay, I'll share my screen now and start the talk. Yep, that's great. So Mo, uh, thanks once again for the invitation. A fantastic uh, plan actually for over the next uh, four days for these 15 keynote speakers to be talking on different uh, events. So a great initiative. So my remit today is to uh, talk about the past, the present and the future of uh, arthroscopic surgery uh, of the hip. And I bring you greetings from Cambridge, UK. So the story really starts in uh, 1931 when this uh, surgeon called Berman actually did some cadaveric experiments uh, and he scoped the hip joint. And this is what he saw, probably the peripheral compartment of the hip. And he made a fairly bold statement there that it was manifestly impossible to insert a needle between the head of the femur and the acetabulum. And that statement pretty much uh, halted all the progress in hip arthroscopy for a few years until the 1980s when there was renewed interest uh, in hip arthroscopy because of interest in sports medicine at that stage. But the real interest uh, came between 1999 and 2002 along with the description of femoroacetabular impingement uh, by the Swiss group. And then 2000 onwards, we've seen a rapid growth and advance in arthroscopic surgery of the hip to the extent that uh, the International Society of Hip Arthroscopy, now Society for Hip Preservation, was formed in 2008, mainly due to the efforts of this gentleman standing there called uh, Ricky Villa. He was a surgeon here in Cambridge. And uh, the first meeting in New York was attended by over 250 orthopedic surgeons from around the world. And since 2009, there's almost been a tidal wave in the number of hip arthroscopies being performed around the world. And if you look at this, 
Uh, this is the growth of hip arthroscopy in the UK alone. And we've seen that from 2002 to 2012, uh, it's almost risen by 727%. And then the projected growth over the next decade is almost about 1400%. And this is the UK alone. Pretty similar figures in the US as well. The credit from the point of view of history in the UK goes to Ricky Villa for doing the first uh, hip arthroscopy in the UK. And I was, uh, it was a pleasure to be his fellow in 2006 and be a part of this evolution and see it through. And I'll try and share what we are doing presently in terms of uh, hip arthroscopy, pretty much share the evolution with you. So the first thing is that the subspecialty is, is uh, very well defined now in terms of hip preservation and has evolved over the last two decades. There are a number of causes of hip pain and they seem to be increasing uh, by the week. And just when we thought we are over femoroastabular impingement in terms of our understanding of it, there are these loads of extra articular impingement syndromes which have been described. So if you look at it anteriorly, you've got subspinous impingement, the iliosoas impingement and pectinia foveal impingement. And if you look posteriorly, you've got to be thinking about ischiofemoral impingement, deep luteal syndrome or ischial tunnel or hamstring syndrome. So all these new diagnoses exist and you really need a clear plan as to how you're going to sit down with your patient, examine them, take that history, and actually get to a diagnosis. So when the patient presents with hip or joint pain, you need to be thinking about the extra articular causes, the musculoskeletal extra articular causes, and then the articular causes of hip pain. And you need a clinical comprehensive, exa comprehensive clinical examination to actually diagnose these conditions. So you need to be thinking of the hip in four layers, you need to examine the hip in five positions and with 21 steps. And that's essential for a young adult with hip pain. Otherwise, you're going to miss those diagnoses. So this is what we do in clinics uh, in terms of the new patient presenting with hip pain. The second bit is the advances in clinical investigation as well in terms of how you actually investigate these patients. And 3D CT scan is a real game changer. So yes, we obviously do the plain radiographs for these patients, AP and cross table lateral. Yes, we do the MRI scans to see what's happening in terms of the labral pathology and the cysts in the acetabulum or the head of the femur. But what really makes a difference is actually this 3D recon. This clearly shows you where the CAM abnormality is, what exactly is happening on to the acetabular side, whether there is a pincer abnormality or not, what is happening on the antro inferior ilex spine? So that is subspine impingement. And then you can rotate it and see the version basically of the femur and the acetabulum. So 3D uh, CT recon is a game changer in planning uh, for these patients in terms of surgery. The second thing is the posterior joint space, which again, the 3D CT scan gives you. And again, a lot of these patients probably are not suitable for hip preservation if the posterior joint space is significantly reduced. And we look at this very carefully before we actually list patients for any kind of hip preservation surgery. The CT scan also allows us for complex deformities to actually do investigations like this. This is clinical graphics, which tells you exactly where the impingement is, collision analysis. And it also tells you how much you need to take off to actually produce impingement-free range of motion. So that, again, is CT-directed. And finally, for complex deformities, you can also do 3D printing to show you exactly where the deformities are, which can aid you while you're actually performing a hip arthroscopy in excising those abnormalities. So CT scan certainly is a game changer in the management of these patients. The next one is a diagnostic hip in injection, which is essential again for investigating these patients. Now, a lot of these will present to you with a fairly chronic history of over two to three years with groin pain. So what we do for these patients is inject the hip joint with just a local anesthetic uh, under image intensifier control, just use an air arthrogram. And obviously if the pain improves, it tells you that the pain is coming from the hip joint and therefore worth scoping these patients. It also is a good predictor of the outcome if the pain actually improves following the diagnostic hip injection. The other thing we've evolved in is picking winners. So obviously uh, 20 years ago, what we were scoping then and what we are scoping now is very different. The indications have evolved. 
and we are actually stratifying the disease as well, be it femoral acetabular impingement or otherwise. We've had lots of studies come through now, and if we look at outcomes, the excellent outcomes are dependent on mainly three factors, the patient themselves, uh, basically what is their mental health, what exactly is the morphotype of the patient, what is the morphology of the hip joint? Can you actually correct that morphology with arthroscopic intervention or otherwise? And finally, what's your technical ability? Now, you need to take these three factors into consideration before offering uh, any patient any kind of surgery, and that is essentially going to be determining your outcomes. So if you look at the Danish hip arthroplasty registry, uh, age, gender, significance of articular cartilage in injury in terms of high degrees of articular cartilage injury and BMI are clear predictors of outcome following arthroscopic intervention. If you look at again the 3D CT scan, the posterior joint space as I've mentioned, and again, if we find cysts in the acetabulum or on the femoral head or edema, now these are patients where it's clearly shown that these are the patients where it'll have poor outcomes. So obviously you should not be offering these patients arthroscopic intervention. Significant rotational deformities or significant uh, deformity secondary to perthes are probably more lending themselves to rotational osteotomies rather than arthroscopic intervention. So we've shied away now from offering these patients any kind of arthroscopic intervention rather than and offer them osteotomies. And then finally, the patient themselves, patients with hypermobility, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, patients who do not have a buy-in in terms of doing physiotherapy for 16 to 18 weeks following the procedure and patients with mental health problems are all patients actually have shown to have poor outcomes following arthroscopic intervention. So again, we need to be carefully considering these factors before we offer them any kind of surgery. The next is advances in technical expertise as well. So what we found difficult uh, about 10 years ago are probably done as a routine. We are fairly clear about how to position uh, the patients accurately now to avoid any complications. So this is the typical kind of setup that we have for a lateral position in our hospital with the result in vector force in that direction, which is parallel to the femoral neck, so you don't have any fractures there. And secondly, we've got clearly defined compartments in terms of the central compartment, the peripheral compartment, and the lateral compartment, pretty much like the knee, the three compartments of the hip, which we can easily access because of advances in surgical technique. We are able to distract the hip easily now, even with posters distraction that is uh, coming in favor. Do not need posts for that. The labrum can be easily avoided and we have easy distraction and we can get into the hip with a 5.5 millimeter scope in the central compartment and have got a clear description of the peripheral compartment as well with the Dean's portal. And techniques like labral repair, excising the impingement lesion, getting into the lateral compartment of the hip have become routine because of these advances with a low rate of complications of less than 3% from the systematic review. Engagement with the government policy and influence has been extremely important for the growth of hip arthroscopy over the last 15 to 20 years, because there was a time when hip arthroscopy was not being funded by the NHS on a routine basis. And we've had to engage with the government actually to make sure that clear policies, threshold policies were defined with the clinical policies forums with the National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence. And that engagement has allowed us to have clear policies for arthroscopic femoral acetabular impingement. And these procedures are now funded uh, regularly in the UK. The next bit, which Mo uh, and I were speaking about a bit prior to this uh, call is evidence. So what's the evidence, okay? And certainly big trials in the UK, uh, the FATE trial and the FASHION trial of arthroscopic uh, uh, surgery versus physiotherapy for patients with femoral acetabular impingement and no arthritis have clearly shown the benefit of uh, arthroscopy in these patients in the shorter term. Obviously, long-term evidence is still awaited. And then the biggest thing that's happened in the UK is uh, the national non-arthroplasty hip registry. 
So we started with the first one in 2016, and it's obviously grown over the years with now over 14,000 procedures, hip preservation procedures, uh, actually recorded in this registry, which clearly shows the benefit of hip preservation surgery, both arthroscopy and uh, surgery for the uh, periastabular osteotomy, surgery for dysplasia uh, in the shorter term. So that evidence certainly helps. And then within our own unit, we've been uh, fairly at it in terms of trying to get evidence for these procedures, whether it is in terms of looking at the complications or the effect of femoral tablet impingement on kinetics and kinematics of the hip joint, and then measuring the muscle strength and seeing how that affects patients with femoral tablet impingement. And then looking at uh, specifically, how do you define the alpha angle? How do you define the head neck junction? What is normal? And then going on to navigated surgery, uh, arthroscopic surgery, and seeing whether that is better than conventional hip arthroscopy and whether we could excise the exact lesions uh, coming in from there. And that's been fairly important to the extent that we've got a clear uh, outcomes-based research program now with MPhils, MDs, and PhD students looking at specifically muscle strength, precision surgery, uh, optimizing prehabilitation and mental health as well to start soon. And that's very important in terms of the progress and the evolution of this procedure. We've also realized over the years that it's actually a team sport. You can't do it alone. You definitely need a good radiologist, a good pediatric orthopedic surgeon, an arthroplast, a young adult hip arthroplasty surgeon, an osteotomy surgeon, appropriate fellows, physiotherapists, sports physicians, and a good national and international network like we have today for discussion to actually make this work. Structured training uh, is very important and has helped the evolution of hip arthroscopy. We've clearly defined what the learning curve for hip arthroscopy is. We've looked at uh, what are the pitfalls preoperatively, intraoperatively, and postoperatively for this procedure? And based on that, uh, we've got a clear structured program and a clear view in Cambridge as to how we should be training for hip arthroscopy. You definitely need a fellowship in young adult hip surgery. Uh, you need simulation training, cadaveric skills training, which we offer with uh, ESCA, and then mentored independent practice once you actually start uh, taking off uh, your practice, you definitely need a colleague whom you could bounce cases off with or who's going to probably help you in the first few cases when you're actually struggling with those procedures. And because of that, we've had trainees and visitors from all around the world actually visited our unit and benefited from that uh, training. Now let's look at the future. Certainly exciting times ahead for hip arthroscopy. I think what's going to make the headlines is disease stratification. The more we look at FAI and how much of arthritis that patient has in their joint because of FAI and stratify that, I think the better we'll get at picking those patients up for arthroscopic intervention. A lot of these patients currently, uh, a significant amount who come for revision surgery have inadequate excision of the CAM lesion. So I think precision surgery is going to take center stage uh, in the next few years, uh, be it robotic or, uh, or navigation. Wet labs and simulated training, uh, as I've discussed before, are going to be key in terms of helping our trainees learn this procedure better. And already there are augmented reality tools out there which are actually helping uh, trainees in hip arthroscopy. Products are going to get better. They're already getting better. Companies are coming out with new products to make this procedure much easier for all patients and suddenly we've got the light going off here, uh, to make this procedure for uh, all surgeons around the world. And that would certainly help both access to the joint and actually doing complex procedures as well. The single most important factor in terms of uh, outcomes seems to be articular cartilage. And the repair of that, be it with stem cells or other uh, matrices, is certainly, again, in the next five years, going to determine how hip arthroscopy progresses. And then finally, national and international trials and in these registries are going to look at outcomes and how these patients progress. And that's going to be uh, helpful for the evolution of this procedure. So certainly exciting times ahead in terms of hip arthroscopy. Finally, a word of caution, it's certainly not for the occasional operator. 
Uh, we wrote this paper almost 12 years ago, and the last lines I'll read for you is it, that the acquisition of Dexity is a slow process and not without complications and should not be undertaken by the occasional operator. So you can't be doing a list where you have uh, a knee scope, an ACL, a hip scope, and a hip replacement at the end of it. I think if you're, if you're planning to take this procedure up, then you really need to be having a list uh, with all hip scopes on it or hip preservation procedures, and that's the way to go. Finally, I think uh, hip arthroscopy has seen a fairly adverse period in terms of people not believing in it. But I think that uh, combined with uh, a clear vision has seen uh, a lot of literature come out on hip arthroscopy with large national and international randomized control trials and now registry data as well. So I think if you combine ad adversity with a clear vision, that's a fairly deadly combination. I'd like to thank everybody from uh, the Cambridge uh, Hip Preservation and the Young Adult Hip Service, uh, all the fellows, uh, physios, Anand Sadesai, the radiologists, and uh, our patients for contributing. Thanks a ton. Superb. That's a wonderful a synopsis, and you did it um, with such grace and precision. Thank you, Vagas. So, um, I'm hoping uh, everyone can hear me right now, and I'd encourage all of you who are on, these are very small group sessions on purpose, so please do feel comfortable to put your video on and contribute to some of the discussion. Let me begin, if I could, um, just with raising um, a couple of points that you said. You said that this is um, a procedure not for the occasional, you know, for the occasional surgeon who's interested in doing this as a, let's say, a hobby per se, among other things he or she may be doing. Can you expand a little bit about what that curve looks like? I mean, when do you start getting, uh, when is competency uh, achieved? And at what point does competency, you know, get into excellence and all sorts of other issues? I mean, you know, I, I presume this, this work has been done as this is when one of these highly, highly popular techniques that's been evaluated. Yeah, so I think Mohit, you're absolutely right. If you if you look at the literature, then I think it's varied uh, from 30 to to over 150 in terms of the number of uh, hip arthroscopies that you need to do to actually get proficient. Uh, so that's what the literature says. Uh, my individual experience is that uh, six months of regular hip arthroscopy in a hip preservation unit, doing it regularly, uh, and over 100 procedures is what it took me to start feeling uh, confident actually getting into the hip joint uh, and accessing it and actually start doing procedures. But I've also got uh, Nicola Bonin from France and uh, Oliver uh, from Spain, and let's uh, hear their views as to what they think uh, uh, is the ideal number of procedures that you need to start feeling good. Probably Nicholas did too, and he was confident. Hey, thanks, Vikas. Nice talk, very, very, always very interesting to listen. But uh, yeah, I really think you need to pass 100 procedures to, to start to feel comfortable. Uh, the, one thing very difficult is the 70 degree scopes. It's, your brain will understand the vision, but it takes maybe more than 60 to 70 procedure and then to, to manage uh, all the capsule on the very, very narrow space takes, uh, takes more than a hundred. And you continue improving for you know, many, many more procedures. hundred is the minimum. That's what I would say. Thanks. Oliver, uh, Oliver what do you feel? Uh, congratulations because for this fantastic presentation, but I think the discussion will be much better than the presentation because I agree with you about 30 procedures just to get in and feel comfortable to move around, okay? But not treating the pathology. So to treat that, I mean, the first step is to do a good indication. Uh, I mean, the beginning of a success uh, surgery is in the clinic. So as you mentioned, uh, our indication has changed around 10 years and you are more strict with the indication and as you mentioned in the, in the presentation, for example, the narrowing of the posterior part of the joint. This is very difficult to assess and not a lot of hip arthroscopies are doing that. And this is the key for success. And when you get in, in a nice indication, maybe your procedure will be I agree also with Nicola. Bonin, um, I think it's 100 just 
do all you have to do in this uh, joint. Can I, ask about, can, I, can I ask can I ask a question just about maintenance? So let, let's say you, you get a certain number of cases to a point. What's the what should be for um, a hip arthroscopist an average annual number of cases? So again, Mo, that's a good question, and we we've chatted about this in the registry and uh, a couple of studies that we were doing in terms of Delphi studies where we wanted to define an expert. And we put the number down to 75, looking at the average numbers done uh, in the country by high volume surgeons. So at least 75 procedures uh, to maintain competency and be good at it. That's what uh, I would put that down to. But, um, uh, but again, uh, we've also got Thanos from Greece. Uh, Thanos, how many are you doing to maintain your competency uh, on an annual basis? Well, it's about 70, as you said, but um, a few years back, uh, I looked at um, uh, a different point of view, the, the, the kind of complications I have. And what I um, uh, saw was that um, initially, maybe, maybe because of caution, maybe because I was doing too few things around the hip, the complications, you know, dropped. After when I get a bit of courage, if you will, or I became a bit more experienced, I started doing more stuff, my complications rose again. And the other thing I noticed is that every time I change something, again, my complication rate changes. For example, as you, I trained on a lateral position. Then I changed to supine position. During this transition, I got into trouble. Every time I changed a different company, for example, I started with Smith & Nephew, now I'm using a different company. Every time I change instrumentation, a setting, you see, it's a very, it's an operation that has to become very routine, very boring in order to go smoothly. Every time you get a surprise, I think you get into trouble because it's a very, very technical operation altogether. That's why we have to be a bit boring, if you will, or at least that's my experience. Uh, Kos, can I jump in here for a question? Yeah, uh, sure. sure. Terrific talk, thank you. And, and either fortunately or unfortunately in, in my town, I'm kind of the young adult hip arthroplasty guy. And just curious, so I, I see a lot of these sort of 40 year olds who I kind of peg them as too bad for a hip scope, too good for a hip replacement. Any advice on how best to manage that? Is there, you know, do, we, do you force them down one avenue or the other, or is there something else that, that maybe I'm, I haven't thought of yet? So I think because that's an excellent question. And I think if you were sitting in the States as a sports surgeon, then your answer would be very simple. Then you just offer them a hip arthroscopy because that's all you've got in your hands to offer. But the joy in the UK is that you are a hip surgeon, right? So you can offer them the right operation, the hip arthroscopy or a hip arthroplasty or, or actually a temporizing injection. And I think for us, the bottom line now, and it's taken us some time to reach there, is the CT scan and the posterior joint space. So I think uh, the x-rays and the MRI scans don't give you that picture. If the posterior joint space on the CT scan is uh, well reduced, then I'm, I'm really shy in terms of offering them a hip arthroscopy above 45. And the data is out there, both from the Danish registry and our registry that shows that the outcomes actually start declining in this age. So certainly uh, decreased posterior joint space plus age uh, equals uh, no arthroscopic intervention. But I, 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 I'm curious to know what, uh, what Nick and Oliver and Thanos uh, think about that. Well, <clears throat> I think, well, it's anyway a discussion with the patients. I really look at the, the age. The age is very important. Of course, you, you will manage differently a, a guy that is 30 years old and over 50. Over 50 years old to do a hip scope, so I, I really need to have a perfect cartilage. Otherwise, I will be very, uh, very, very slow down. And uh, under 30, I will push the, the hip scope, even if the, the cartilage is really quite bad uh, because he's, he, he's young. So you, you need to give him a chance. Uh, and you, sometimes you have good surprises and it can s stay uh, up to, to 10 years uh, uh, without well, waiting for the, for, the, for the replacement. Even if you need sometimes injection in, in between to, to make it uh, stay longer, your, your results, your arthroscopy results. Um, another... <clears throat> 
another point that I, I like to, to have a look. We do, we perform CT, Arthro CT from a very long time. So we can first see what you were describing uh, because that is very important, the, the posterior space narrowing, but also the, 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 the cartilage. And of course, when there are lesion, mirror lesions, then this is a no-go, whatever the age. Mirror lesion, it's, it's all finished. And the last thing that we ne never really talk about, and for me is, is important, is the, the, the cyst. When you have be, uh, even small acetabulous cyst and the, the, the underlying bone, when you have chondral lesion, but also underlying bone uh, lesions, then in this case, uh, you must be very aware because microfracturing or, 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 or the procedure for cartilage preservation won't work that good. So that's my opinion. Cool, thanks, Nick. Let, let, let me just also make sure if there's anyone else who has a question or wants to um, get something clarified, please, you know, just unmute and let us know. And we'll, you know, uh, you've got some experts here who'd be more than willing, I'm sure, to share their insights. Um, I, I would like to comment something about that. I, uh, Nicola Bonen is a friend of mine, also Thanos and, and Vikas. But um, I agree partially with, uh, with uh, Nicholas about that. And I think sometimes when we, when we see a patient 35, for example, with a bad cartilage, I think the best surgery in that guy just to keep up active and, and doing everything and good quality of life is to do a replacement. Because uh, the success of this patient uh, with hip arthroscopy sometimes is not so good and sometimes also uh, get worse after this surgery and, and start with some psychological problems after this surgery. So I think in that case that the cartilage is not so good it, and the patient is 35, maybe uh, total hip replacement will be the best option in that guy because actually you have like 20 years, 25 years with a good quality of life doing more or less a lot of sports and, and, and a lot of activities for uh, his age. So. Uh, I don't want to be to fight again my colleagues and, and being like uh, Mourinho, but uh, but just just saying that. Uh, it's not a fight, uh, Oliver. It's a it's a debate, and I love debate, and Vikas love debates, and everybody of us loves debates. So we, we thrive on it. <laughs> it's important. No, I was talking about under thirty, Oliver. Under thirty, thirty-five becomes the the changing. 30, after 35, it's getting, after 50, I really, you really have to push me to do a scope. Uh, but uh, under 30, you really have to push me to do a hip replacement. So, okay, I think there's someone, between, want to jump, yeah, I think there's someone else who wants to jump in here. I think, I don't know if it's Thanos or Margaret. I see two people unmuted. So does someone want to say something? <laughs> well, um, I would suggest that it's very hard really as a question uh, so uh, it takes a lot of discussion with your, your patient to define the goals what you are trying to achieve now arthritis is, you cannot beat arthritis end of story um, but you can have a discussion about maybe supplementing uh, hip arthroscopy with some biological agents either that being prps or stem cells um, so um, putting the, the right goal if you will is very important also, uh, when I have this discussion with uh, arthroscopists or with sports medicine colleagues, I sometimes uh, put the question, if it was a knee, would you scope it? Would you wash it out? Uh, and if you would, for the same age group, uh, then uh, I don't see why you shouldn't do the same thing for the hip. Yes, it is much bigger operation altogether, more difficult, but in the right hands, it can be reasonably as quick as a good knee scope. So, uh, I don't think there is an easy answer. It's about uh, uh, patient need uh, to um, tailor it uh, to, to, to each needs and uh, quite a bit of discussion behind it. If it was in my hip and I'm 45 now, 46, probably I'll go with the hip scope first and then um, um, you know, discuss the option of the hip replacement. But in terms of evidence uh, more, uh, I think this clearly shows that we need more evidence in, in this arena. Uh, but in terms of evidence, all we know is that for FAI with TONUS-1, if you compare it to physiotherapy, then uh, hip arthroscopy is better in the shorter term. That's all we know. The rest is all conjecture and, and uh, personal experience. That's, that's the bottom line. Yeah. 
And, and you know, I definitely have a, a couple of thoughts on the evidence. But before I jump in, I just wanted to make okay. sure everyone else has had a chance to speak. Margaret, I know you had said something. Did you get your question answered? Would you like to? Uh, thanks. Well, I had my questions um, mainly answered, but I have I will have another question. Um, so I practice as a sport medicine physician, and um, one question relates to in the Danish study, one of the other stratifying um, considerations was gender. So can you can somebody address maybe how that comes into play with choosing your patients? And my other question was. Uh, in the case of uh, labral tears, so in the setting of um, FAI, does the labral tear become rather inconsequential? And also maybe touch upon the isolated labral tear in an otherwise healthy individual without significant chondral changes. What are those um, patient uh, stratification characteristics? So sorry, there's a whole bunch of questions there. <laughs> I, I think we can, we, we can definitely spend the next uh, hour discussing these three questions, but, but I'll try and be brief. I'll start with, a I'll start with the third one first. So I think right. uh, the, uh, about 65% of the patients who present to our clinic or in that age group will have labral pathology, but that does not mean they're symptomatic. So if they're asymptomatic with labral pathology, then you basically don't do anything with them. That's, right. that's, that's, that's the answer to your third question. Um, right. So in, in terms of uh, the Danish ship registry, and um, uh, we haven't found that, let's, uh, simplistically, we haven't found the same effect in our registry. So I'm not sure how true that is, uh, but that, that effect is really uh, amplified uh, in other registries as well, I'm not sure. So I'm not taking that as a hard fact that one uh, gender is going to do better than the other. It's a, a lot of other factors which come into play as well. And uh, the third question was, I've, I've lost it now. What was the third question? Well, it wasn't really, it wasn't really a question. It was just that in the face of um, established femoris tabular impingement, does the labral, do the labral yeah, issues sure. become inconsequential? Okay, so, um, and I think that is true. So for me, the m most important thing is the CT scan and the deformity itself. Uh, how much of version deformity is there? What is the cam size of the cam lesion? What's the pincer? Because technically, if there is a cam, you are going to have some labrochondral pathology anyway. So it does yeah. become inconsequential and, and you're going to address that as a soft tissue resultant pathology. Right. So hopefully that answers your questions. Okay, thanks. So I have a question and I realize that we have uh, gone a little bit over, but when there's discussion that's this rich, we want to continue it uh, for a little bit longer, if, if you'll indulge me with the question um, and get your, and get to where did I get a chance to talk to so many experts at once? So why don't we uh, proceed with this one? You are all clearly, um, you know, those on the panel are clearly expert. You've had great experiences. You, you've thought carefully about the problem. But then there are hundreds and hundreds of papers on hip arthroscopy coming out per year, and maybe from groups that maybe aren't as thoughtful as you are, and there's a lot of negative studies coming out. What, from your perspective, are the big problems with some of these trials that say FAI surgery may not necessarily uh, improve outcomes? What are the, if you and maybe the other way to put it is, if you're going to, if you, if you were designing the perfect study, what would be some of the big issues that you'd want to overcome that you believe haven't been addressed in some of these trials that seem to be negative? Awesome question, Mohit. And I'm actually going to put the ball in my fellow's court now, who's beginning to do a PhD, Mr. Sunil Koma, and he'll, he'll enlighten you first. I hope he answers it correctly, and then we'll modify it. <laughs> Sunil, tell us, what are, what are the main problems? Thank you, Mr. Kanduja. Fantastic talk. Uh, yes, uh, it's all to do with the outcomes we are measuring. Whether we measure, you know, uh, we talked about the two trials, the FATE and the FASHION, which came out uh, from the UK. Both of them have shown uh, physiotherapy is marginally better than, sorry, uh, hypotoscopy is better than physiotherapy at two years, but they have used different outcomes. Uh, FATE's used uh, about seven or eight different outcomes compared to FASHION. And there's no comparability between the two trials. And uh, off late, we've been talking about core outcome sets, uh, in, uh, you know, in which, which are used in uh, randomized controls trials so that every trial's being done in the future 
have the same outcome so that we can you know do a systematic review and meta analysis and get you know outcomes which are, have got a better um, you know um, you know value. Well, so, yeah. so I'll, I'll, I'll help him out. So basically, we're looking at core outcome sets rather than one specific measure. And that's not uh, the same across all trials more. So that's been a major issue in terms of comparing trials. And the second thing is disease stratification. You know, uh, unless and until you're able to stratify disease appropriately, you know, we use tonus grading, which is, which is uh, obsolete, actually, if you look at it. So we need to use uh, appropriate imaging techniques to stratify disease. And if the patient has got grade three, then we should be comparing grade three to grade three um, on a CT scan or an MRI scan and actually then compare outcomes. So from my point of view, these are the two issues. The core outcome sets are not being defined and the disease stratification is not similar across uh, all studies to be able to compare data and actually uh, look at what exactly is going on. Well, so, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this for us. In terms yeah. of controls, right? So what happened with the knee? You know, I think it was Thanos who said, you know, think of it, and I'm not, I'm not saying you ever think of it, the hip as the knee, because there's very different, uh, you know, very different issues that at play in both. But when the, the minute we started getting to controls and the knee in which patients particularly weren't aware of what they had had done, it slightly changed some of those outcomes, you know, and there's this concern of people saying, well, if it didn't work in the knee, it's probably not going to work in the hip, you know, the, the whole issue of the scope. Do you believe that um, the answer will come with the appropriate controls as well? Like what is the, what is the ideal control patient in a trial that would convince the world this in fact, you know, that, that, there, that, that, that there is in fact benefit? And is it a sham? You know, I guess that's yeah. I mean, I mean, and and that's exactly what I was going to say. The best control is going to be a sham if you if you really had to prove uh, that this actually works and and silence all your critics. Uh, so going back to the Oxford uh, Andy Carr days, we really need to think of the same thing that he did in the shoulder uh, to repeat it in the hip and uh, do a sham surgery to make sure that that's your ideal control. But I'd, I'd like to hear from Nick and Oliver as well what they think. Absolutely. I think uh, sham surgery should be the best control for that. Um, but we have a lot of um, uh, different factors that can influence also in that. Uh, as I told you before, the indication is one of them. Uh, we are comparing, for example, gender, females and males, but the morphology of the hip is completely different between both. So the pathology usually is also completely different. So we need to choose the best group of patients to, to compare this sham surgery also uh, about indications, some surgery, but with the same indication. Mo, let, let me ask you this. You've obviously been uh, helping people, mentoring people from the research point of view. What, what in, and you obviously have read all these papers, what do you think is the ideal way of going ahead? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think um, generally, like if you want to really impact change, um, you have to have enough patience. So the, I think the biggest challenge with most studies are they're just not big enough. I mean, I'm, it's a simple thing, but you know, so multiple investigators, multiple sites, multiple people. And obviously when there's something that, you know, you openly have said that there should be criteria for expertise. So an expertise based design, you know, there's all kinds of designs, but at a minimum feeling comfortable that the people who are doing the procedures are, are you know, are, have, have a reasonable level uh, and, and comfort level with everyone else doing them. That's the one big challenge is, are these findings generalizable to those who are doing hundreds of cases versus those who do 10 or 15, right? I mean, that's one, large enough patient sizes and also really compelling outcomes, like outcomes that would be compelling to anyone to say, yes, this, this is definitely uh, an improved procedure. The controls is, the, is one of the bigger issues. And, uh, you know, if you look at the history in knee, you can extrapolate that people are going to extrapolate those sorts of findings to the hip. So they're looking for, quote, well, of course it doesn't work. Oh, there's a big placebo effect, right? And historically, we couldn't really determine what that effect was. But now we know that, you know, taking a, a, a sugar pill um, has a little bit of an effect. Getting a needle injected into your knee, like, like let's say for hyaluronic acid, just the needle with saline has a much bigger effect than any pill. And then having a, a quote, a sham surgery has a massive effect relative to a needle. So we'd have to adjust for that somehow. 
um, you know, or have some way of measuring the outcome that would control for those measures. And it's hard, like it's really hard to do. So no disrespect to any of the studies that have been done. It's just a really hard design. But this group of people, if you put your mind to it, could probably do these studies. But the number of cases that are happening, the number of opportunities, there's no reason why there couldn't be a large international mega trial, uh, you know, well over a thousand patients. You know, we're, we're, we're in the, the large trials now are a few hundred patients. But, you know, we've seen it in uh, trauma that you can do 10, 10 15,000 patient studies with the number of cases, you should be doing big ones. And then it'll be very easy. Now you have a registry, so, you know, that'll help. But anyways, I won't go into a big a diatribe on, uh, on the design, but generally speaking, you know, the hardest thing to do is know something works when you're, when you have spent your, you know, a big part of your life on it. And then, it's, then spending the rest of your life trying to convince people it works, right? So part of that is if you work together, you probably can get those trials done and make it fundamentally a standard in the way we think of everything. And I think it's getting there, but you just, you're, you're, you're just missing a little bit more data. But then aren't you losing the true equipoise there? Because all of us may be, or certainly are, uh, fairly biased in terms of this procedure, aren't you? Right, right, right. But that's why the controls are so important. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. if the surgeon is aware of his or her, you know, the control arm, um, then for sure you can do different things. But the patient being aware they've had surgery is a hugely powerful, you know, uh, event. So that's why operative versus non-operative surgeries are very difficult to, you know, to pull off because patients already have the built-in, you know, perception that surgery will help cure me. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, that's why having some control, which is a perception that the patient has had surgery and that some of these sham studies are tough to do, but that would be the real definitive way to sort it out. And that way you probably will sort out, as I think Margaret had said also, which is the, the, probably the soft tissue issues aren't as critical as the bony issues. And in the first trial, that's just, I believe, just uh, published. I think published, it's just yeah. published now yeah. Uh, yeah. in British Journal of Sports Medicine. Same thing, right? The one-year outcomes, I mean, there were tons of differences in, in, in patients, you know, getting you know, various degrees of, of labral pathology. Um, there was no difference at one year, but slowly over time, you started seeing that difference in the second year. And maybe it's timing as well. But anyways, anyways, there's so, lots so, to be thinking about. So, so Thanos, uh, Thanos, Nick, and all of us, what he's saying is the European uh, uh, Research Collaborative Network should easily be able to get 1,000 cases done. Uh, fairly quickly. Indeed. And I think one of the main problems is that we live in an arthroplasty world. So we are all quite accustomed to define success or midterm results at 10 years, success at 20 years, and so on and so forth. Joint preservation is a totally different ballgame altogether. So quite rather so, what is success after a surgery like that? Is it a good x-ray? Is it summer returning back to sport? So there are so many variables that they're hard to define. So defining those, I think, is uh, the first thing, the first step, isn't it? But yeah, um, yeah. um, Vikas actually has made the suggestion, as he did now, is uh, for international collaboration from different countries. So uh, different group of set of patients, different rehab, get a, a you know big groups and uh, defining this. Listen, I think we could speak for another two hours easily, and, uh, and I'm very, trying to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, on that note, I'd like to thank uh, our speaker, Vikas Kanduja. I'd like to thank uh, Vikas Kanna for uh, you know, helping uh, uh, co-moderate this, and all of you, so uh, the wonderful panel who have all contributed. Thank you all for taking a bit of your day or your evening to spend with us. This will be recorded, as you know, and we'll be sending it out, and we'll make sure we get these links out to you uh, going forward. Uh, can't thank you enough for spending time with us on this ortho evidence world tour um, as we continue. And if you have interest in other ones, please do uh, uh, look us up and uh, join us for other events. Thank you so much, everyone.